Hello and welcome everyone. This is Jamie from the Marvel and DC Databases. Back at you one more time. Thank you so much for joining us again this week. We actually have a really, really fantastic show. We have uh, a special guest who we'll get to in just a moment. Today I'm joined by Kyle, uh, obviously from the DC Database. Our topic today is Steve Ditko. Um, we obviously it's a very broad topic. He's done so much and he's been in the industry for so long. There's a lot to talk about. We're going to try and pare it down and, and talk about how he's been a strong influence in uh, the industry and just a little bit about him and some of the things he's done that's impacted. And uh, by all means, please do all your uh, do a great amount of research on him if you haven't already after the show. But um, I would like to introduce our special guest, uh, Zach Cruzi. He is uh, a comic book writer, a scholar. Uh, specifically a scholar on Steve Ditko as well, uh, an occasional podcaster. Um, he teaches um, uh, he teaches collegiate courses actually at Fort Wayne University in English and in comic books, which is an interesting piece. We'll maybe talk a little bit about that. Um, and uh, as well, he's founded a convention. I know you all uh, love to go to comic book conventions, so if you're anywhere near Fort Wayne, Indiana, please check out the Appleseed Con uh, Comic Con. Uh, it's going to be a great show. So that was actually uh, organized and founded by. Uh, by Zach, so uh, welcome, Zach. Hi, how you doing, man? Oh, absolutely great, thank you. Um, glad to glad to have you with us uh, to talk about uh, Steve Ditko today. So, just a super uh, high for the uh, level uh, introduction for those who haven't um, already, you know, become aware of Steve Ditko's work. He's uh, f uh, created that one character, um, Sp Spider something, Spider Man, I think it was. So uh, obviously, he's had a lot of influence. Many characters beyond that, um, some Marvel, some DC, some neither. And a lot of them you've heard of. Probably my favorite character that he's ever created, uh, very uh, famous character, Squirrel Girl, uh, is also a Steve Ditko co-creation. Um, I'll just toss that out there. But uh, uh, we'll get right to uh, maybe talking. Kyle, uh, Kyle, you have a great number of thoughts and maybe some questions for our special guest. Would you like to go ahead and start? Yeah, uh, Zach, I'm, I'm a pretty big uh, DC and Charlton fan, more so than Marvel. But, I mean, obviously, he's kind of had, you know, an, an, uh, an impact across comics. And I was hoping you could fill us in a little bit on kind of what, how much of an influence he's had, is, especially at Marvel, because I'm not familiar as much with Marvel, but with the other companies as well, kind of the, the impact and the influence he has even today. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a really good question. It's a really broad question, but it's a very good one. Um, it's, it's hard to pin him down to just uh, influence at Marvel or just as influence at DC or with Charlton or wherever um, because what he's done is sort of his career some of the most influential aspects of his career is just sort of spanned multiple publishers actually so which is I think is tremendously fascinating uh, because it's not like anybody else has really come before him or wasn't like anyone else that had come before him um, he started in 1953 working out of Jerry Robinson's studio uh, and if you see, if you read some of his really early stuff, you can see how he's, you know, starting to get his feet wet and really just sort of get into, um, you know, his his own style. And uh, you know, a lot of his really early stuff, it's really hard to distinguish early Ditko from very early Joe Kubert. Um, it's very difficult to do sometimes. So, so, but as he progresses and as he sort of um, builds sort of a a sense of time and a sense of uh, a sense of pacing and that sort of thing, um, things start to change rapidly for him. And you know, by the time he's working at Atlas, timely before it comes before it becomes Marvel, I mean, he's really picked up a lot of steam and he's really developed his own sort of sense of artistic voice. Um, and when he gets the Spider-Man gig, uh, Kirby created the character, gives it to Stan Lee. Um, Dit uh, Ditko was supposed to do the inks. And uh, so when Ditko, and as Ditko's inking it, he says, oh, my God, this looks exactly like another character Jack created, the fly, for Archie. Um, so they scrapped the Kirby idea because of that, and Ditko sort of reinvents the character after that point. Um, and so what happens there is not only does he reinvent the character, but he kind of he reinvents or invents a new uh, branch of the genre, of the superhero genre. Um, up until that point... And this is not new for, I'm sure, many of your uh, viewers. Um, but up until that point, so much of what you know, comic books were, and uh, were up to that point, and were afterwards, were sort of these really, they're just vignettes, you know, at best, episodic in nature, maybe one or two issues, 
uh, for a story arc. And what Ditko does at Spider-Man, which is radically different, uh, and this is where a lot of my research and uh, criticism and that sort of thing has come in, the stuff that's I've been published uh, or that I've had published, is what Ditko does is he takes the character of Spider-Man, he takes Peter Parker, and he puts him on this sort of long-term trajectory. Uh, it's like an, it sort of works out to be an epic. Um, and he puts Peter through these psychological paces that uh, really weren't being done in any other superhero comic at the time. Um, and he starts out as sort of this nebbish, you know, he's very introverted, he's shy, he wants to be a part of the collective, and then eventually, of course, he becomes this sort of robust individual by the time Ditko leaves in 1967. Um, and when Ditko, what, but here's where it gets really cool, and this is where sort of his reach and um, is really demonstrated in his sort of uh, narrative reach is really demonstrated. Is in 67 when he leaves and he goes to Charlton, right? And he goes to Charlton be because he has sort of, he has more artistic freedom. Um, he really doesn't stop writing and creating stories for Peter Parker. Ted Cord is basically Peter Parker. Uh, it's just a new Peter Parker. Um, he's, he's the grown-up version. I mean, that's the trajectory that Peter is on. When Ditko leaves, he's at, uh, he's in college and he's you know, on his way to become something potentially great uh, in industry or whatever, probably industry because of Ditko's sort of uh, Randian capitalist ideas. Um, and then when that character picks up as an adult in Blue Beetle, I mean, that's sort of the logical extension of the character. So, so that's one way where he really impacts the industry is that he's the very first, as far as I can tell, to put a character on sort of a long-term trajectory. Um, and not only does he put one character on a long-term long-term trajectory, he puts, he spans that over to different characters because he wants to tell a single story. It's not about just Peter Parker, it's about sort of this romantic ideal, this individualist ideal that, that um, Ditko wants his readers to um, sort of glom onto. Um, so that's one way he, he really radically changes the industry. He's, he's so, so far as my research can tell, he's the very first to ever do anything like that. Certainly in a mainstream comic he is. Um, the other way where he really, again, radically changes things is with violence. Um, it's not, you know, everybody knows that before the comics code, superheroes used to kill people all the time. I mean, that's that's old news, right? You know, Batman carried a gun. Superman would throw would throw uh, would throw crummy landlords off of buildings. You know, that sort of thing. So that's not new. We all know that. But when the code comes along, I mean, really, even before the code. Superheroes stop being able to do that um, because of parents' groups and conservative interests and that sort of thing. So the code comes along and imposes all these, uh, but you know, sort of cements all of that, codif codifies it. Um, and what Ditko does in f is he just basically says, "Fuck you, <laughs> we're not going to do that anymore." Um, and in the backup question backup feature in Blue Beetle, it's Blue Beetle number four. There's this question backup feature where these two thugs uh, are fighting the question. They're down in the sewer, and um, they get hurled. The thugs get hurled into the sewer, and they beg the question for mercy. They say, "Save us! Save us! You know, it's your duty." And the question says back, uh, "Duty to whom?" Uh, and then just sort of lets them float away. Um, certainly, in the original uh, script and the way that Ditko constructed the story, they're dead. I mean, he allows he doesn't necessarily murder them, but the question doesn't necessarily murder them. But he certainly allows them to die. Uh, and then later on, because of the code, um, Steve Skeets, who uh, basically did the script, uh, wrote, wrote the dialogue for Ditko's story. Skeets goes back, and because of the code and the editors at Charlton made they made him put in a little you know box at the end that said you know that made it seem ambiguous when it was clearly not ambiguous at all they died. Um, that's a really important and radical shift in how superheroes are approached. Um, and it's, it's after that point where other superheroes start to take on more violent tendencies. Um, and, it, you know, here it becomes more it gradually, very gradually, it becomes more acceptable for heroes to kill. Um, now certainly, Ditko's working within an era where, you know, there's ex where the exploitation film is sort of 
coming uh, coming about. So the, there's that sort of social influence that pushes people towards those more violent heroes too. But in comics, certainly in the Silver Age, it's Ditko that changes it, um, and which is really important not only because it's that sort of that's not only is that sort of the pivotal moment, but um, that's the moment that Alan Moore sort of harkens back to um, in the you know in Watchmen. I mean, not only is he more you know reimagining. Ditko and some of the other Charlton superhero characters, but he's, he also sort of reimagines that moment, right? The question says to those thugs, duty to whom, right? That's really stunningly similar to, uh, to Rorschach say, you know, talking about the dying whore reaching up and begging for mercy, and then he whispers no, right? I mean, that's not accidental. Um, so, so it's, you know, as comic fans, uh, you know, a lot of us sort of tend to credit Watchmen and Dark Knight for sort of introducing heroes who kill and that sort of thing, but it's not really Watchmen and Dark Knight. They popularized it, certainly, to the greatest degree, but it's really, it starts with Ditko in 67, um, because that's who Frank Miller and Alan Moore and several others are taking their cues from. So I know that's a long answer to your question, but um, but, I, but that's really his sort of greatest impact, not just creating characters like the question of Blue Beetle, Spider-Man, Doctor Strange, but the narrative choices he made and how those narrative choices would be sort of uh, carried out and, um, uh, you know, picked up by, by his, his predator, his, uh, the people that would follow him. So, um, and it, it's really, I don't want to be too hyperbolic, but I think it's really hard to undersell that, how important that is. I, I would totally agree, but I, I, to touch on a point that you had made earlier, um, he controlled the narrative. How how much in history would you say prior to Ditko did the artist control the narrative of the story? I mean, today you see nine people or ten people, you know, credited on any given comic. You have the inker, the penciler, the you know, the writer, the letterer, the uh, you know, the editor. You know, you have nine people that you know. It takes a village to write a comic book, but back in the day. Although there was still a team that made it possible, would you say that Ditko or someone perhaps prior to him sort of conjoined that idea of artist slash writer and and really not only developed the characters visually and and from a you know character uh, standpoint, but also their their as you say their narrative and their their trajectory. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's it's hard to sort of cast too wide of a net because. Comics are such a complicated medium. It's it's hard to say one person did exactly this all the time, unless there's some sort of record of it, or at least some sort of um, anecdotes about it, or something. But in the case of Marvel, I mean, we can we can almost assuredly say that Kirby wrote those the stories that he drew, um, yeah. and Ditko wrote the stories that he drew. Um, and, and, and we we know we we know this from accounts from both Ditko and Kirby. And then when Lee sort of slips a little bit, it, it, um, it the the truth comes out from him as well. So um, it's it's hard to sort of it's hard to for me to definitively say how you know how uh, different what Ditko did was compared to all of his peers. You know, both at the Distinguished Competition and at Marvel. Um, but really, but certainly at Marvel, for Ditko, for Kirby, they're doing the writing. Uh, they might have a story meeting with uh, with Stanley, or Lee might make some sort of um, adjustments afterwards in the editorial process while he's going back and uh, editing dialogue. But uh, but Ditko and but Ditko and Kirby certainly were doing that. Um, they it, it, and I mean that's that's the reason that Ditko fought so hard to get the plotting credit. Um, he certainly I mean. There's some debate about when he started really uh, taking over and doing the the bulk of the writing, but cert but without a doubt, by issue 18 of Amazing Spider-Man, Ditko's doing the writing. Stan's just going back, filling in dialogue, um, and I suspect that that had been going on probably even before that. Even even when they're having their story meetings, um, Stan might say, "Let's do Doctor Octopus," and then Steve would take Doctor Octopus and then fit him into the larger trajectory that he had already been working out. So, um, you know, and, and in, in that way, too, I mean, that, that again, makes him very important. Um, but I think that, I, I, I think, to sort, of, to sort of put a bow on that, I guess, I think 
I think that did because that Ditko had the amount of creative control that he did, and that Kirby had the amount of creative control that he did, um, certainly over the stories, is really a result of the sort of Marvel system, um, you know, mm-hmm. or the Marvel method, however you want to say it, because they were really left to to their own devices, and then Lee would come in, put in the dialogue, and then take the credit. So yeah. I, I I think it's a product of the system less than it is sort of them saying, this is exactly what I'm going to do, and them coming in and demanding that they have to be permitted this process or anything like that. Right. So uh, how much of that in, was influenced by the way that Marvel's pay structure, or any company's pay structure worked back then, in terms of working for hire, or like how much do you think that influenced their th- their creative capabilities and also their, their need to both write and draw and basically run the whole show themselves. Well, that's why Ditko left, right? Um, he, he, he left to go to Charlton because even though the pay was awful at Charlton, um, he, he had full creative control. Um, but also, the, the other side of that is that the, the biggest reason, and people seem, there's this strange thing where people are conf- claim that they're confused or that they don't know why Ditko left um, uh, Spider-Man, and the answer is pretty clear. I mean, Ditko has said so. It's uh, it's reasonably well documented. Um, Ditko left Spider-Man because he wasn't getting paid. I mean, he was getting he was getting his paycheck, of course, but he wasn't um, he wasn't getting he, when uh, Martin Goodman sort of worked out the deal for the '67 Spider-Man cartoon, and Ditko wasn't going to get any significant royalties because Goodman had sort of fudge the numbers, as it were, like, oh, we're not actually making a profit on this, right? Um, that sort of thing. I mean, that's why Ditko left. He, he left over creator rights issues. And, and, in fact, he encouraged Kirby to do the same. Um, but Jack didn't leave because Jack had a family to feed. So uh, Dick, where Ditko's always been on his own. So the decision for him was a little bit easier. He didn't have familial ab- obligations. Um, but, I mean, that, that's, that's exactly why he left. And again, I mean, that's why that's why he does so much, you know, for uh, so much of his output is creator owned, and um, and, and I, I don't want to besmirch anything that he he's done. But if you look at when he returned to Marvel in the early '80s, I mean, you can see that it's not phoned in, but his heart isn't in it in the same way that it's in something that's coming out at the same time, like say um, Static or something like that. Um, yeah. The the uh, it's it's a paycheck and he doesn't have a problem with that, but uh, but I think that that certainly um, I think that that shows in in the work. I mean, it's hard it's hard to say that his work on Chuck and Horse and the Karate Commandos, or even creating Squirrel Girl, is um, you know as you had mentioned earlier, is really on par with anything that he was putting out you know uh, through Revolver with Robin Snyder at, in, during the same time period. Um, even the stuff that he had done with uh, DC earlier in the 70s where he still has a little bit of control and he's really exploring these bizarre ideas with Shade and Odd Man and Hawk and Dove and that sort of thing. Um, you know, I mean, you, you, can, you can tell that his heart really isn't there because, uh, because the creative control is not there. Absolutely. It's, it's funny. Sorry. Go ahead, Kyle. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, uh, we kind of we kind of discussed what... Uh, Steve did at Marvel, but I kind of wanted to talk a little bit more about like his career after Marvel. Like you know, he did the Charlton, he did DC, he went back to Marvel at one point, but he also did a lot of stuff on his own that I don't think people are as aware of. And I, I, if I understand it right, he's still putting work out today. Yeah, yeah, he still had. He, in fact, uh, they ju- they have a kick, uh, Kickstarter going currently, um, and yeah, he still produces brand new work. Um, but yeah, right around the same time that he left Marvel, he started really getting involved um, with uh, independent publications. Where and the biggest one that, that his most famous sort of um, independent or creator-owned uh, character is Mister A. Uh, Mister A is basically just a more extreme version of the question. Um, I mean, if 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 Mister A is Coke, then the question is Diet Coke. You know, it's just one calorie. Um, so, uh, but uh, but yeah, no, he, he created Mr. A, and, and that Mr. A was sort of became the mouthpiece for his um, his philosophy, which a lot of people sort of want to really 
they want to they want to pigeonhole Ditko and say that he oh he's this very strict objectivist and he's a you know, uh, 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 a disciple or whatever you want to say of Ayn Rand. I don't think that's entirely true. I think Ditko's more complicated than that, and his work is more complicated than that. Uh, and it's not it's not always objectivist, although it certainly is, uh, sympathizes with objectivism. I mean, he certainly is influenced by Rand. He likes her work a lot, but he's not quite an objective. I mean, he's not he's not quite a full on you know objectivist zealot like I think a lot of people want to paint him as. I don't think that that's I don't think that that's fair. Um, and, and I think it's a, an oversimplification of his work. Um, but yeah, Mr. Ray is certainly the biggest one, and he created that for a Wally Woods um, fanzine called Wit's End. Um, and then after that, it sort of gained a life of its own, partially because of the violence that he uh, was so fond of. Well, fond is probably not the right way to the sort of rational violence that, um, that he introduced. And he got criticized a lot for that, for the violence, the superhero violence. And he wrote numerous essays. Uh, sort of combating this idea, saying that it's fantasy violence and you need to relax, um, was basically just what he was saying. But yeah, he did a lot of that, and he, and he still continues to do that, but that's where he created uh, Mr. A, and, uh, The Avenging World, and characters like Static, um, and several others. So, but you know, but that that's that's the work where his heart is, but you know, he did a lot of, you know, his work at DC, uh, and then his work at Atlas Comics, um, in the 70s is also really interesting. Um, like The Destructor, I think, is a fascinating book because you can tell Steve is telling one story and the writer is telling another one. Mm -hmm. um, so so I, I think that that's sort of an interesting case study. Um, but, but yeah, it, it, the, and the objectivism stuff and sort of his philosophy is much more pronounced um, after he leaves Marvel. Certainly with the question at Charlton, um, and absolutely with Mr. A. But really, it, it even sort of creeps into other books, too. Hawk and Dove, um, the showcase uh, issue of Hawk and Dove, and then the, the two or three issues that he did. Even though Denny O'Neill is um, Denny O'Neill's doing the script, I mean, Ditko's really controlling the story for the most part there. And, um, you know, the Hawk and Dove stuff, I mean, I think Hawk and Dove is probably the clearest, one of the clearest explanations of his philosophy. Um, because if you think about those early issues, there's Hawk and Dove, right? And Hawk is this very violent, warlike person, right? And then Dove is, the, you know, the peaceful sort of pacifist guy. Um, and it's only the two of them together that sort of form the complete hero. They're not really any good on their own. And I think that that's Ditko's philosophy. I mean, he believes in peace and he believes in, uh, you know, caring for people and caring for yourself, mostly caring for yourself first. Uh, but he thinks that you know you have to balance that with uh, with a with a firm hand. Um, so you have this sort of interplay between those two characters and trying to form the complete person, the complete idea. But the beauty of that, the beauty of those early issues is the father, the judge, right? Because the their dad's the judge, and he's the one who comes down the middle and says, "Hey, wait a minute!" All the time, he's saying, "Hey, wait a minute." You know, here's the way you should be thinking about this. Here's the way to be rational about this. Here's the way to be really thoughtful. Um, and it's really, it's really wonderful stuff um, because there's not a lot, there's nothing like that happening at, um, at any publisher. I mean, certainly politics are are seeping into comics all the time. I mean, I mean, for Christ's sake, look at you know again O'Neill and Adams, uh, Green Lantern, Green Arrow, and, and a lot of other titles. Um, liberal politics are, are very much at the forefront. Um, and even conservative politics are too, but there's nobody that's really saying what Ditko's saying. He's not he's not liberal. He's not conservative. He's something entirely different, um, and radically different. So um, I, I think that's sort of I think that's probably the one of the more important aspects of his work is bringing that to uh, a large number of readers. A lot of people hate him for it, but there's a lot of people that um, appreciate it. I guess too. So that makes sense. So um, to move just a, a little bit closer, um, if if I were a new reader and I were to want to get to know Steve Ditko, obviously you know 1960s Amazing Spider-Man, fine. But what would you say is some of his earlier, some of his mid, and some of his late work that would be considered essential reading if I wanted to bone up on uh, Steve Ditko? 
Sure. Uh, for early work, you can't go wrong with the the, the horror and sci-fi and weird tale stories that he has been doing. Um, a lot of those came out from Charlton or through Charlton, um, and you just you can't you can't go wrong with those. Period. Um, he really that again. That's like I was saying to Kyle's earlier question. I mean, that's where he really um, start, starts to hit his stride and, and become, I think, the greatest visual uh, sort of layout person um, in comics uh, history, the greatest cartoonist as far as that goes. He's certainly one of the five best um, ever. Uh, so, I mean, the, the early horror sci-fi stuff is, is fantastic, and Fantagraphics, um, Blake Bell has been editing the Ditko archives for Fantagraphics for a long time, and um, you, you can't miss with any of those as far as early stuff goes. Um, in the middle of his career, I mean, of course, there's Spider-Man and there's Doctor Strange. I, I think I think most people, and rightfully, most people sort of glom onto Spider-Man because they know him more. Um, but Doctor Strange is a really, really, really exciting work, um, especially when you get to characters like Eternity. Um, and when you think about a character like Eternity, here, here's here's what's wild about him. So Eternity is just he's just space in a, inside of a human form, right? So okay, fine. I mean that's that's a weird, wild kind of exciting idea. But th think of it this way. Think of it in comparison to everything that Kirby did. Everything that Kirby did during that time is very externalized. It's about going out into space, it's sort of the cosmos, cosmic heroes, people sort of coming in, um, you know, from other planets, you know, uh, Galactus, Silver Surfer, all that kind of stuff. I mean, really imaginative, exciting stuff. But it's all external, right? It's all very extroverted. And then compare that to Ditko, who takes, who doesn't take space and make it all expansive. He takes space, he takes all of the cosmos and puts it inside of a person or an entity, whatever you want to say, right? Um, sort of internalization of the cosmos, the internalization of, you know, what's uh, wonderful and exciting and mysterious about the world, that by making that internal, um, that really says a lot about Ditko the artist, Ditko the writer, um, Ditko the person. Um, I mean, I, th I think that's really fascinating. So, I, I, and not that people really overlook Doctor Strange, but um, he certainly doesn't get the attention that I think he deserves, uh, and it's just amazing stuff, um, re and really, really inventive. So if I was thinking mid, if I'm thinking '60s Ditko besides Spider-Man, you got to read Doctor Strange. Um, and then after that point, too, uh, an another sort of aspect of his work that a lot of people overlook, um, or another sort of portion of his look, sort of in that middle of his career, post Marvel, um, and then later, besides Mister A. Uh, in the independent stuff is his work for Warren magazines for Eerie and Creepy. He did a lot of those um, horror shorts for Warren. Uh, they were mostly written by Archie Goodwin, and the stories are they're fine. I mean, they're just five, six, seven, eight page horror short stories. Uh, you know, in the in the vein of EC, of the EC horror stories, but um, but the Dead Coast stuff is really wild and really good. He um, it, you know, so much of what we see from Ditko is just very straightforward. Uh, the panel, you know, the great panel layout, but, you know, it's it's pen, right? The pen and maybe a little brushwork. Um, but in the, char or, excuse me, in the Warren stuff, he he employs this ink wash technique, and it gives us so much depth, and it's really exciting to read. Um, you, you, uh, you really need, should read that. Um, those are available uh, from Dark Horse in their archives, uh, the Creepy and Eerie archives, but they also have a Steve Ditko collection that they put out that's just the Ditko stuff from um, from Eerie and Creepy. Uh, so you can't go wrong with those. Um, as far as late Ditko, um, say 80s and beyond, you know, the, the, if you're going to read late Ditko, then you really just need to be reading his uh, stuff that he either self-published or his creator owned. Um, I mean, the stuff that he did at Marvel when he came back, and he did like a Superman story with Mark Miller, and you know, he and uh, Chuck Norris and the Karate Commandos, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, Rom the Space Knight. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing that I dislike about any of that stuff, um, especially the Rom issues. I really like the Rom issues, but but his his best work is coming out with Robin Snyder and, and on his own. Robin Snyder published uh, a lot of stuff through uh, Revolver. Again, that was Static and a few other things, 
but um, but also his creator own work. I mean, it, it it's it, you can't miss it. And um, and, and the great thing about it is that I, it's the there, the, the great thing about it is that so many people want to pigeonhole Ditko in sort of his with objectivism, and, and I get that, and I think that that's not an unreasonable criticism. But uh, you know, like I said before, it's really an oversimplification of his work. Um, and and uh, you know, the, the deeper you look at it, and the more you consider what he's doing, um, you know, there, there's a lot there to really think about and appreciate. You know, once you get past sort of the didactic um, elements of it, there, there's really a lot going on there and a lot to think about. So that that's how I break down those three eras. Yeah. Well, that, that's perfect. I, I I like all those suggestions. I admit I haven't read everything that you've listed, so I think I'll have to reach out and uh, grab uh, something of those and uh, brush up myself. Kyle, did you have any uh, questions or final thoughts that you wanted to uh, introduce? I wanted to talk just a, a briefly about uh, you know where where Steve is today in the world of, of comics because comics have blown up. Like there's comic movies. Stan Lee is on the big screen every time you look. Why is Steve not? Um, why does he not get the publicity of you know creators like Stan Lee or you know some modern creators? What what's the disconnect there? Uh, he doesn't want it. Um, it's another myth about Steve Ditko mm -hmm. that. Um, He's a hermit. He's a recluse. He's not really. Um, he's certainly not as. Uh, he's certainly, um, let's say, more introverted than many of his peers. I mean, he's not like Kirby, where Kirby, you know, late in his life and really throughout his career, you know, was always at conventions and always giving interviews and that sort of thing. Um, you know, that's that's not Steve. That's not his personality. And, and he's certainly not Stan. I mean, he's not. He's not a carnival barker. He never will be, and I, I think there's a part of him that um, that doesn't. I, I think he understands the the necessity for people like that, but that's certainly not who he wants to be. Um, he he'd rather live his life on his own terms, and um, he believes, and I, I that's hard to find fault with this. He believes that honorable people will behave honorably, and um, that his work stands on its own. Um, he doesn't recognize the right of the three of us or anyone else on his time or his person, so he doesn't really grant interviews. Um, and it's not that he is um, not vocal about his career and his work. He writes essays and he responds to fan letters all the time. Um, but uh, but he doesn't recognize the, the right of... The, the sort of assumed right of a lot of fans where they think that they have to know everything about him. Uh, he sort of takes that as someone wanting to own part of his person uh, or his personality or something, and um, he, he just doesn't cotton to that. So so he rejects it. Um, but again, you know, that's, that's not the same as being a recluse or a hermit. I mean, he writes essays. He still produces new work. I mean, for, for goodness sake, I mean, he's selling stuff through Kickstarter, right? I mean, you don't sell things through Kickstarter if you are so hermetic that you, like, you know, don't leave the house or anything like that. So, um, you know, and uh, he's not like – this is the last thing I'll say about it because I think this is partly where the last bit of your question was going, Kyle. He, he's not like Kirby where he's not like not – like, the Kirby estate. He's not going to sue Marvel. Um, he's not going to sue Marvel because for a lot of reasons. Number one, he uh, left on his own terms. Um, number two, he's not going to sue them because it would reduce him to the level of those people of say Martin Goodman and those people that um, that screwed him. Um, and he already made his feelings plain. And you know, like I said, you know, because of his sort of philosophy and his personal code of honor, that sort of thing. I mean, he's going to, uh, he believes honorable people will do the honorable thing. He makes some royalties, albeit very small, on reprints of his work from Marvel and DC, but um, but he's not about to, um, he's not about to sue Disney at this point. A, I don't think he has the income for that. Uh, I mean, not that I know, I don't know that, but, um, but that would certainly be a very expensive endeavor and B, um, you know, he he's not he doesn't I don't think he's convinced that it would solve anything. It doesn't prove anything. 
um, his work speak again. His work speaks for itself. So you know that's sort of where he's at with that stuff. It's just it's complicated. Let's say as a lot of the history of uh, comic books has been, but certainly of the earlier creators, especially uh, looking at the creators of, uh, you know, uh, Ghost Rider and, and Superman and a lot of the ones that are embroiled in a lot of, uh, uh, you know, crit or controversy and whatnot. But uh, something that isn't of any controversy is uh, Kyle's distinct love for the Odd Man character. Uh, Kyle, did you want to talk about Odd Man or did you want to ask a question by any chance? Uh, I just don't think any uh, conversation is complete about Ditko if we don't talk about Odd Man, just because of, of our love for, on the DC database for the Odd Man. So I just wanted to, you know, have Zach, you know, I'm sure you've read the, the one story and that Ditko uh, did with the Odd Man, and of course he still appears now and then at, you know, DC, and I just thought we should talk about him because it's a, it's a little bit happier note to end on than, uh, than Steve's kind of financial uh, situation and his is kind of disrespect a little bit in the, the community at large. Uh, yeah, well, and to be clear, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't know that he's necessarily a pauper or anything like that. I, I don't know that that's true, but I certainly know that he's not making millions of dollars off of his work. Um, but, yeah, I, Odd Man is an odd character, yeah? Um, <laughs> it's not just a clever name. Um, odd Man fits into sort of this... Uh, sort of batch of superheroes that Ditko had, and I, I'd throw Shade the Changing Man in there too, but like Shade, Creeper, Static, uh, a handful of others, um, maybe even the Destructor, but not really so much the Destructor. Um, you know, he just sort of fits into this group where he's just, he's a weird hero, right? It's sort of this weird hero genre that Ditko has. Um, and... But what's funny about him is while he fits into this sort of weird hero genre, he also fits, he's also a very Ditko character because when you think of like sort of his origin and like who he is, like who his identity is and that sort of thing, um, you know, a, a lot of Ditko's characters, you know, they have, um, they have these very stiff, stern names like Vic Sage, Rex Grain, you know, uh, and uh, you know that sort of thing. So, so Odd Man, Odd Man certainly fits into that group as as well. Um, what I think is, what I think is most interesting about Odd Man, uh, at least in that issue of Cancelled Comics Cavalcade that he appears in. Well, I guess it would have been an issue of Shade the Changing Man, but um, the thing that I think is to me is most exciting or most interesting about Odd Man is sort of his his gadgets because they don't. I mean. His gadgets are so goofy, right? right? I mean, they're certainly like the goofiest gadgets. Uh, I mean, he's got the extending tie, right? And he's got the gloves where he claps his hands and it turns into dust or something like that. Um, right. Yeah, so, you know, he, he's, he just sort of, I mean, it's a very Ditko character because it sort of fits into that sort of odd hero that he was, or strange hero that he was developing in the uh, in the 70s and in the early 80s. Um and, uh, and really, there's some remnants of that, too, with Squirrel Girl. I mean, even though Squirrel Girl's not really his full creation, uh, and, and Speedball, too. I mean, there's sort of that sort of weirdness about them. So uh, that's I totally agree, and, and with Kyle, there's no good episode without talking about Odd Man a little bit anyway. But um, uh, just any final thoughts before we do wrap up on the episode? We are running a little bit short on time. Is there anything else you'd like to... Uh, say about Ditko or about uh, his influence or, or where he is today? Uh, yeah, well, <clears throat> as far as his influence, um, I think Ditko's really underappreciated. Uh, I mean, th certainly there's there's people out there that really love him, uh, myself included. You know, I've, there's my work that's been published, but uh, Craig Yo has, has done a lot to sort of keep the uh, Ditko's work alive. Uh, so is Blake Bell, uh, regardless of whatever differences Blake and um, Steve now have. Uh, but... Um, but but you know those two guys have really done a lot to sort of keep things going, uh, and, and I hope that I've been able to contribute to that in some small way as well. I hope that people get out there and support Steve and support him through his Kickstarters and that sort of thing, um, because he really is a, one of those people like Kirby that um, created the modern Mer modern American mythology. I mean, it was Kirby and, and, and Ditko that really created all of that. Spider Man, Fantastic Four. I mean, that that's who we are as a people. Um, them. Bill Finger and, and Siegel and Schuster, so you know I, I hope that more people sort of seek out his work and, and uh, learn to appreciate it on a, on a deep and personal level. Um, 
in, in you know, it's, uh, just sort of a, it's the last thing I, I'd like to say about him, not just should people check him out, but, um, you know, take, take a minute and read them in the context. It, it, take, take a minute to read Ditko in a new context. Don't think about Watchmen anymore. Think about Ditko and what Ditko did to bring these characters and bring these new notions to life for all of us because it's really him that changed it's really him that changed the way that we read, read comics. Kirby invented the superhero genre. Ditko changed it forever. Um, and uh, that there's, it, it's really hard for me to understate that um, without getting all emotional and, and teary and stuff. So, um, so read Ditko, kids. Well, absolutely. I couldn't have put it better myself. Read Dead Code Kids. We're going to include a number of links uh, below in our video that to not only some of the essential reading that we've talked about today, but also if we can find it, we'll uh, post a link to that Kickstarter. Uh, so please uh, go out, check out that Kickstarter, contribute. Uh, he is, uh, you know, as as has been mentioned repeatedly, a fantastic creator, and uh, the the works that he does best are the ones or where his passion is in it, uh, not where he's restricted by, um, you know, we'll call it corporate influence, but we'll we'll just say where he's where he's free is where he's best, and yes. so. Um, so absolutely check all that out. I want to say a very special thank you. Uh, Zach, you have been fantastic. We appreciate your, your joining us. Uh, May 16th and 17th, 2015, if you are anywhere in the United States, we'll say, go to check out Fort Wayne's uh, AppleseedCon. That's AppleseedCon.com, I think, is if that's right. Uh, so other than that, uh, thank you very much. Kyle, you've been fantastic, uh, as always. And uh, Zach, thank you so much again. No, thanks for having me on, guys. I really had a lot of fun. Good. Well, hopefully we'll have you back if we ever, uh, certainly if we ever talk about Ditko, but otherwise, uh, if there's anything else, uh, we'd love to have you back anytime. So that's all Absolutely. for this week. Um, take care and, and let us know what you think in the comments below.